ask you if you could tell yourself when you started at MIT one thing yeah. what would you tell her <laughs> at that yeah. hold on to the uh, the seat belt <laughs> it's a bumpy ride <laughs> Were, for the Forbes Under 30, were you approached and had an interview or did they kind of take what they found of you on the internet? Thing, the first Forbes 30 Under 30 was someone had nominated you. And so this was interesting um, because, yeah, when someone nominates you and then you grow through with whatever that is, like, I, I think I was coming from a background with a more like industry bent where like they see that as a positive thing, like all these awards and recognitions that are non-standard. So basically, to what extent, like, definitely 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 in theoretical physics and just in science more generally like like attention is not good for the sake of attention mm. I think that there are certain situations where if you were like say starting a company or whatnot and it was a matter of like these different acc accolades or recognition would help you promote that or whatnot it is a good thing and so I think that I had mentors who were in a different part of like they were not physicists mm. who would promote or nominate or something I have no clue who nominated me but that was my oh, wow. impression is that I had mentors from before all my mentors were in aerospace and maybe to them that would be a cool thing oh this is fun and it's not just oh this is fun when suddenly you are given a reputation to a public who don't care so much about the research mm. uh, that puts you in a position you don't deserve to be in that is basically putting you in a position where you're benefiting from the reputation of a lot of established people in your field Right. So it's like almost making it harder to do well in that field. So I'm super happy that I feel like I'm in a good place research wise now where like it didn't mess me up um, there. So I'm grateful for that. And that's why it's funny in hindsight, but it definitely wasn't super funny in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure like I asked for a um, like a broomstick or something when Harry Potter came out. Like, I think that's the extent <laughs> to which I wanted to fly. And then like, I have these parents who are like, let me translate that into something real. Like I can get you to fly. Like you might want to, and then like some of the aviation stuff started. Um, and so now I'm like suddenly like, you know, flying just um, uh, like with a, with an instructor, right? So you can fly with an instructor at any age. And I was like nine when this stuff started. And at some level, it's interesting because somehow they think that you're on this precocious career path. So people decide like, oh, if you're flying around, then you're going to be uh, like my airline pilot one day, start up like aerospace companies. And so at the time it was like, Jeff Bezos wasn't there, but like Blue Origin was one. I know like uh, Branson, Richard Branson was around Air Venture and, and, and uh, Virgin Galactic had a presence and then also Space was at the time. So you basically had these people who had made money in some other field, you know, with whatever products or whatever entrepreneurial skills. And then they wanted to have these passion projects in aerospace. And those are kind of these cool kind of mavericks coming in. I think I went into, air, like, into physics because of the aerospace and because of the people I admired admiring physics. And that's not a good route to go because you actually don't know what it's like to do research, I think, until grad school. What does it mean to be cool in a field like physics? Yeah. Which oh, I think we're going to be cool. I don't think I'm cool. Like, I don't think my research, like, I think it's, it's getting cool. It's like, sorry. It actually is. Sorry. It's pretty cool. So what I think is cool about it, and I'm surprised, I mean, like, I'm as surprised as you that I would actually say that too, because, because, because basically we have, we got this awesome grant where it's like basically 13 faculty from all around the world. We have 8 million US dollars to spend on like bringing people together to work on this thing, hiring some postdocs. And like one, it's like, there's a, like, there's a private, like foundation, the Simon Foundation that I think kind of sets the cool trends. To the extent where people follow where the funding is and where the jobs are. Now, I wish that what that turned into, and I think it can, is that people become more mobile. Like, I'm more than happy to, if this is a hot topic that, like, if we all work on it, um, we can make free progress. I think it's great when funding can direct that. Mm -hmm. But I just want to hope that we can basically not convert, but it, that it turns into things where people who are doing other things come in and work on the thing rather than that you create people who only know that thing. And then when that funding dries up or whatever. So I think that my field kind of became cool because now it has the resources to mesh into other fields. And then I think that the level of like sociology that I've had a lot of time to think about for reasons unrelated to the research um, puts me in an interesting position to at least try to be, um, to have conversations about that without bashing the field. Like I, I, if anything, like I respect the people in my research field way more than I've 
respective people that I've interacted with in other situations uh, prior, like other like job experiences. So I think these are really awesome people. And I think that if we, the ones of us who maybe don't feel like we all want to feel like we're only in it for the research and that's all that matters. But like there's realities there that we sometimes are afraid of talking about. And I think that I'm less afraid because I'm like, holy shoot. Like I never thought I'd be in a position where I'm actually like the research is going well and the job security is good and da, 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 right? So can we change that? Does it need to be that way? I am excited about all those things. And I think that's pretty cool. And I think perimeter is really cool. So by association, I'm really cool. So <laughs> like when I, when I got offers, I got offers here and I got offered at Brown. And I don't think it, I thought it was an obvious choice because I thought, okay, Brown is like the establishment. It's like this validation. I made it to a tenured track or maybe eventually tenured uh, faculty job at an Ivy League institution. Like how amazing is that? That's great. Um, but like perimeter, it's like you have the, all the infrastructure, more infrastructure than like say I think Brown has. And I would almost say like more efficient infrastructure for physics than even like Harvard. Maybe that's, maybe that's controversial. But like we have the infrastructure of this like world-class institution where theoretical physics is a priority. And so mm. if you're a theoretical physicist, like that's amazing because you're not like you have to like in coming from an engineering background, I know like people would be like those who can't do teach or like they, they did negative attitude just towards teaching, let alone theoretical physics because like engineers are solving real world problems. And so like at a university, where is the money coming in for it? Like it's cool to be at a place where it literally is for theoretical physics. Um, mm -hmm. And then you see it also in just like the building is designed to have more collaborative spaces and stuff like that. And then you're working more with people. So it was just a combination of, I think that my personality matches the position better. Um, and we have some really nice people here. And then also like you can do some fun, like you have summer students doing kind of techie stuff, like research workflow questions. I would never be at a place where that would be considered anything like but a distraction. And so I love my job. So yeah. how old were you when you first remember being called the next Einstein? And can you tell us that story and how you look back on it now? Yeah. Okay. So I'm pretty sure that I was like the only time it was called in quotes like that or anything was this title of an article that was by Ozzy. And so I came from, my family would be the type where it's like, you wouldn't turn down opportunities. And so I, I don't hold that against them, but it is a different, uh, I don't know. It's a little bit bootstrappy or whatever. It's like, like if someone offers you something or they want to like interview or whatnot, it'd be very hard to come to terms with the notion of saying no to things that are like, you might miss the opportunity. So they were going to interview me for something or they want to highlight. And you have this cute story because you have this airplane stuff. You're like probably the only theoretical physicist, like with that much of an airplane story. There's actually some more that, that fly, which is fun. Um, but they want to interview mostly for that. And then, you know, you're doing stuff that I guess, I'm not sure if I would remember if Hawking cited the work before or after that, but around that, um, you're a new grad student. You really don't know what you're doing in that field, but you know, why not this girl about anybody else? Like, why not say she's like a, a super, well, can be a superstar, right? It's a, it's a promise for the future next. So you have a interviewer who thinks it's harmless to just yeah. put a moniker or whatever, because, you know, Anybody you talk to is not actually called that would love to be called that. You'd think you'd love to be called that, but you wouldn't if it's a, it's like basically, um, I'll, I'll get to why you wouldn't want to be called that. But there were other things where Ozzy was overhyping stuff. And I think, I even remember specifically, I think we said like, oh, like don't put some sort of weird name like about it or whatever. Like, and they wouldn't let you see the article because that would be unethical or whatever. So I had no clue. It went mm -hmm. out. I remember very distinctly having this thing where it's like, oh, if it doesn't go well, like no one's going to care. Like, I, like, you know how you ever have like a moment where you like, really uh you remember it because you remember thinking like it was obvious that it wouldn't matter and then it did <laughs> and it's like oh my god because somehow it randomly hit their little like likes or shares like I think I got like a million likes or something I don't know if it shares like but and that was a lot at the time right and then things get renormalized so that mean, mean nothing nowadays with TikTok but at the time it was a lot and it wasn't like everybody knew you but it definitely if enough to affect your life uh and so ah, very, very weird. Um, and that was the start of a little bit of a interesting blessing and curse type of thing going on after that. Like what I'm saying is, is that you wouldn't want anybody to actually believe you're that when you have nowhere near the credentials to be called anything like I'm a great scientist, by which I'm saying it's a funny position to be in when everybody who knows your science or knows that things are overhyped, know it's a joke or whatever. And it's funny, huh? Okay. Uh, but then like you get these opportunities, like you're meeting like 
president or like um the queen of another country uh and it's like you're meeting them on this pretense that when you go up and shake their hand someone's gonna say this is the next thing i mean it's like it's embarrassing it's like how can you turn down that opportunity you're meeting all these cool people and you see this value of like pop like pop science um and but anytime you're in that position you basically either have to like hold up a like oh maybe one day like that hope that things are going to do well for your research well, not that you'd be anywhere near that and then you're told that you're too modest or something if you say that so it's like super weird how like your sense of self can get degraded when it's something where like I was never an imposter I was probably the least of all the girls in this, like the least imposter syndrome because I had a very high opinion of myself and then like this like this overhyping just broke yeah broke that better semantic search would probably revolutionize the, the the workflow that we do like being able to take a picture of a board and then turn that into notes like yeah. there are a lot of cool things that I think only a place like perimeter would be willing to like invest in like or build those partnerships in a very proactive way where it's not tech money but like tech expertise mm -hmm. so like I'm super excited to be at a place where I can do with like so I can do politics or I can do tech or I can do research all in one place and it's like what is this place I love it I love it yeah. that's awesome <laughs> yeah